Oh man. According to the wiki, this movie is based loosely on the source material, and man, they couldn't have been more correct on that front. So I don't know if you guys know about it, but Doom from 2005 was a wild ride of, wait, what is happening? And then also, wait, what just happened? But then again, I'm no film critic. There is, however, an interesting idea that I would like to discuss as it pertains to genetics concerning this movie. So in the year 2026, humans would uncover something that would be a complete game changer. Linking us to the planet Mars via a portal known as the Ark, the portal was almost hidden, or almost purposely hidden, deep within the crust in Nevada. After its discovery, obviously a scientific venture would be launched to move through the portal to see what was on the other side, which is interesting. But we will cover something I noticed in the movie, and you probably did too. However, while on the other side, it seems that the portal was really meant to be an escape. So let's get to this demonic invasion turned completely biogenetic and discuss what was the thinking behind these monsters and why they turned the way they did. All right, with that out of the way, you'll see a timestamp up on screen if you want to bypass the summary of this movie that is supposedly based on Doom 3, but I'm not buying it. Then you can jump straight into that juicy science. Otherwise, let's get to the breakdown. We open up this live action movie in the same way most live action movies open. Complete chaos. A group of scientists are running from some unseen monster. As they continue to haul down the hallway, many are being picked off one by one. Eventually, Dr. Carmack is the last as he shuts the door on a colleague, leading to her demise. He then sends out a distress call back to Earth, stating that quarantine needs to be enacted as something has escaped. The door is broken open and an unknown beast lurks just beyond its borders. Back Earthside, the Rapid Response Tactical Squad, or Double RTS, is getting ready to go on some leave for the first time in six months. Sarge receives orders from his superiors to save data from the scientists and escort them out as well as secure the facility. The group loads up and then heads out to the Ark. Initially, Reaper is asked to stay behind due to his connection with the planet, but he decides that it's better for him to come along anyways. As they ride along, they are briefed that the UAC had to shut down the lab due to some sort of threat. The squad isn't too sure what that threat actually is, as nothing is being relayed to them. The squad rides on the elevator deep down underground and towards the Ark. As they descend, they are met by UAC employees who have the Ark secured. They approach the Ark with a team, one by one, and all move through. Okay, so I break off from this idea that the Ark is actually pretty cool. The idea of being ripped apart on an atomic level and transported has always been kind of something that we assumed warp travel would be like, or not really warp travel, but portal travel. Anyhow, after they reassembled and then puke up their guts as a result, they are met by Pinky, the site director. Pinky briefs them on what is happening, and during it, the kid asks if traveling is always that rough. He mentions that it used to be a lot more rough, and some turbulence would happen, which is how he lost his legs. So I break away again. So this confirms that there are actually multiple jump points across the universe that humanity has access to, unless his legs were sent back to Earth. His legs were literally sent, though, at least from what I believe, to an unknown facility. And I mean, I get Mars is screwed, but why is nobody kind of exploring that other route? Anyhow, after their briefing, they go upstairs, and then are met by Reaper. Reaper's sister, Samantha. Samantha begins talking about a few of the experiments that they were conducting on the planet, including new technologies. She goes on to say that the reason they are doing less than ethical experiments up here is because the planet is no longer alive, so it beats doing it back on Earth in your own backyard. During the attack, one phone was left off the hook, and all can be heard screaming. As they all continue to make their way through the facility, they do not find any evidence of any person around. The only thing they really turn up are some sketch experiments taking place with animals and what it appears to be human arms. And speaking of arms, arms develop development. The Sarge locates a tool known as the BFG, which will be quite handy later on. As Reaper and Samantha, or John as he's known, continue to pull information, he spots a skeleton shielding a child. Nicknamed Lucy, the bones were brought up from a dig site on Mars, making them native, at least by our definition. As he continues to inquire about the humans on this planet, it comes out that it was really just a humanoid. She doesn't believe that they were human, but instead may just have the bone structure of humans. She pulls up a file showing that these creatures actually had 24 pairs of chromosomes rather than the standard 23 pairs in humans. She goes on to say that these people literally have conquered everything. There is no record of diseases whatsoever in their population. Cancers, viruses, bacteria, whatever that could attack their body seemingly was no longer an issue. On top of this, the 24th chromosome caused the cells to divide up to 50 times faster than normal, making them borderline immune to damage to their body in a conventional sense although obviously they could be taken out. Which brings me to the skeleton shielding the child. Just a bit of a plot point, but how did she meet her end exactly? I mean, she became petrified all while holding that position. From what we see with the monsters in the movie, they are really just tearing people apart. It's just, I, okay, anyways, never mind. John brings up that maybe these humanoids were just naturally superior to humans, and Samantha says they were not natural at all. The earliest fossils she found were actually just like humans. They had 23 chromosomes, and instead, this 24th chromosome appears to be bi 
bioengineered and also appears to be administered as they became more technologically advanced. She suggests that maybe they met their end through time, to which John rightly deduces you don't shield a baby from time. After having these discussions, Dr. Carmack quasi attacks a group, then runs. The soldiers give chase and back him into a corner. He drops the arm that he was holding, but appears to be degrading somehow mentally. Samantha approaches him and he rips off his own ear. Samantha then says that she will take him back and talk to him as she knows him, but this would prove to be a terrible idea later on. Taking him back to medical, they all begin working on him and running tests. They pull some of his blood and determine that it appears to be some coagulation within his cardiovascular system. After running an analysis on the blood, they find that it doesn't match any known blood type in humans. While running these tests, however, they look back to see that he has gotten off the gurney and has escaped. While they were doing this, the rest head out to locate the body that was supposed to have the attached arm. Portman and the kid move through the hallways and eventually find a woman. She turns and has a demonic face, and they put her down immediately and then radio that they found the rest of her that should attach to the arm. Moving into genetics, the group finds that all the animals from earlier have been ripped apart. With organs sprayed all over, they eventually find a lone person standing over the mouse cage, eating them. The creature turns around and then brandishes a bone saw and runs at them. They quickly take him out, and now Dr. Olsen is out of the game. The team eventually begins chasing something big later on that they just catch a glimpse of. As they tip to corner it, it moves down into the sewer system of the facility. Giving chase, Sarge, the kid, Reaper, and Goat all descend and begin moving through. They eventually find that another scientist is down there and completely done as well. Moving through, eventually Goat is attacked by the creature with multiple eyes and has the creature transfer something into his neck. Eventually John is able to subdue it with a punch and a ton of shots. They drag it back to the medical lab where they're trying to resuscitate Goat. As they keep trying to resuscitate Goat, they would ultimately fail and then they reveal that the creature that did it is in no way human. They assume that it must be completely alien and then shut down the Ark after sending all the civilians through. Max shuts the door behind them after arming Pinky and they begin the autopsy of this creature. Eventually, the entire team meets back up and they discuss what they should do at this point. Sarge is also looking a little crazy-eyed when Portman mentions that the SOP states that they need to call in reinforcements. This will be important later. As Samantha waits for Duke to return, she gets a little freaked out and then heads through the nano wall. Eventually, Duke does return and as he's in the hallway, the creature begins attacking him and then slices open his arm. As it runs at them, Samantha is able to close the nano wall, trapping the creature in the process. Next, the man with the least amount of screen time is also sent to check out an area alone, which that's 10 out of 10 thinking, we all know it's gonna happen. Max slowly moves through and then something is clearly stalking him. After John's flashback about his family getting buried in a rock slide on Mars, Mac hears something and turns around and his literal head is knocked off his shoulders by the strength of this creature. Sarge and Reaper give chase as the creature runs, and they are able to wing it before it escapes entirely. Continuing the autopsy from the beast that they captured earlier, they begin trying to figure out what it is. As they do, they are finding a lot of human-like organs, but this doesn't necessarily prove that it's human. They then find that the appendix of this creature has been removed, and that pretty much seals the deal that it was absolutely human. At this point, Goat stands back up from his seemingly earlier ending. He shows that he's actually still in there mentally, and he appears to know what he's doing. He then begins slamming his head into the glass, breaking open his skull, and ending himself for a second time in the process. Sarge at this point has now acquired the BFG, basically the only thing in this movie that actually relates to Doom. Portman ends up leaving Destroyer and heading to the bathroom. He feigns his original plan and really is in there just to call reinforcements. Seeing as Destroyer is alone, however, the creature takes this moment to attack him. As Destroyer slowly moves, the creature grabs him and begins flinging him around. Destroyer is then thrown into the holding cell from earlier. He gets up and begins engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the beast. After a hard-fought fight, he's able to pin the creature against the wall, electrocuting it in the process. Unfortunately, this thing is huge, so the juice required to put it down obviously didn't do it the first time, and it won't do it this time. Destroyer tries to make his escape by climbing up the chain, but ultimately is knocked off and falls back into the pit. However, this time he lands wrong, and the sound of it kind of makes me think that maybe he snapped his spine upon landing. As Portman sends out a call for help, he exits the stall to find a rat. When he does this, a creature then grabs him from the roof and starts Sarge runs in, firing the BFG. Unfortunately, however, it appears to cause atomic decay from the looks of how much heat it's producing. So, whether it was the BFG or the infected, who's really to ultimately say what took Portman out? Back in the medical lab, Samantha is conducting an experiment on the creature in the wall. She begins to understand that the beasts that are attacking them are just really people who are infected. The beast in the wall was actually Dr. Carmack. The one on the table is Steve Willits, the original person that they were actually all looking for. She mentions how they're all genetically mutated and might even be reversed. Sarge then begins to lose it and then kind of just takes out Dr. Carmack saying that now his situation is irreversible. Samantha continues
continues to protest that they aren't doing anything sketch, but Mr. Nanowall over there suggests different. The data she was downloading shows that actually some really strange things were happening on Mars. Apparently Dr. Carmack took some of the 24th chromosome and began human trials despite not getting the go-ahead. Well, the go-ahead from the ethics committee anyways. The subject was lowered into the holding pit shortly after injection. We can see that his skin has become blotchy and eventually all the bones begin undergoing morphological changes. Presentation of genetic mutations begin to manifest in the hands first until ultimately this would likely change the entire skeletal structure. Reaper and Sarge then haul back to the Ark after Pinky calls to tell them that something is cutting through the door. They find that Pinky is gone and the Ark has been activated. Sarge orders them to get as much ammo as possible as they're heading back through to contain whatever just went through. Reaper then runs back to grab his sister and as he does she has a revelation about what's going on. She shows that the infected appear to prefer people over others. The monsters are choosing who to infect with this chromosome based on their brain matter. Sam postulates that the monsters are latching onto certain neurochemical markers within the brain. Some humans with the 24th chromosome were superhuman while others turn into monsters. She suggests that maybe 10% of the coding of the human genome is what contains good or evil. Basically a soul, which uh, I'm not so sure about that but we'll discuss it later. Upon exiting the Ark they find that most who are on the other side of the portal are just done. Sarge then goes back to double tapping to make sure that nothing gets back up and walks around. The rest of the team follow suits, popping shots the whole way down the hallway. As they move through, they do eventually find those who returned feasting on those who were able to be run down. They annihilate the whole group and they move even further in the building. As they continue to do so, they do find that some civilians did in fact make it. The Reaper ironically says, don't take out everyone, and Sarge goes on to take out all the civilians asking for help, as he believes it's a full infection that can't be helped at this point. Duke finds Pinky in a pile of people as he moves through, and the kid goes on to find the previously mentioned civilians in the back rooms. Sam mentions how many others may not be infected or even capable of being infected. But unfortunately at this point, Sarge is beginning to totally lose it. The kid runs up and mentions that the civilians are there, and Sarge asks him why he hasn't taken them out yet. The kid disagrees and then takes a bullet in the throat for it. Reaper at this point isn't too jazzed with the Sarge. He turns on him and they both square up. Pinky freaks out and brandishes his own handheld, and then he's attacked by the creature that came through the Ark as it throws him around. The Sarge attempts to take out the creature, but it's fruitless, and then the thing runs through a nano wall. Reaper and Sarge move through giving chase, and they stop as a horde attacks them, and then they have to move back through the nano wall. They quickly move though, but as they do, the wall won't close as Sarge just accidentally broke the button because uh, he's exhibiting some strange attributes. Duke is then dragged through the floor and meets his end, and the Sarge is grabbed through the wall. Eventually the wall does close, and the ricochet hits Reaper, injuring him in the guts. Based on the bleed, gonna have to say it's probably an abdominal aorta bleed. Sam attempts to patch him up, but realizes the only thing she can do to actually save him is inject him with the 24th chromosome. She says that he's not evil, so it won't turn him into a monster. He protests, but she notes that he's bleeding to death, so she injects him anyways. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it works out for him. He hands her his handheld, just in case he turns, but she turns it down. He passes out after the injection. When he wakes back up, we see that something is kind of way more doom-like, which is pretty awesome. He approaches the mirror to see that all his wounds and cuts have now completely healed, indicating that the injection has worked. Now entirely hyper-focused, he systematically makes his way through the compound, which this, again, is arguably the coolest part of the movie, but it kind of needs more metal. But hey, we even get to see a Hell Knight, which is pretty dope. Moving even further, we see that the Hell Knight is wielding a chainsaw, which is even cooler. And this would indicate that even though they have become absolute monsters, tools at their disposal haven't completely gone outside of their ability to grasp and understand. Moving further in, we spot Pinky, and Pinky is now turned into just a god-awful version of Pinky. So after taking the chainsaw to it, he eventually bisects it mostly, mortally injuring it as he puts it down permanently. Sarge then shows up mentioning that he took care of the civilians, and as he does, the quarantine is lifted. He mentions that they should probably just go outside and get some fresh air, but then Sarge's hand begins splitting open his glove to show that he's actually beginning to change. They open fire at one another, and the situation devolves into a hand-to-hand -hand fight. It becomes clear as the fight goes on that Sarge is beginning to change into whatever these creatures are. With Monster vs. Superhuman, the room suffers heavy damage until eventually Sarge is forced through the Ark. As he is, Reaper then throws a grenade through, blowing up the Sarge and the Ark in the process, sealing the genetic testing on the Red Planet until humanity can get there by its own natural technology levels. Reaper and Samantha then exit the facility, and we get to the end of this movie. So first things first, what is going on with this story, and what is going on with this movie? I figure covering this may be the best route since, you know, I'm not sure if this is actually canon to the Doom universe, but surely not, seeing as there's no demons, just genetic anomalies. So once upon a time, prior to the stripping of the Mars atmosphere, roughly around the same time as what we think Venus was, likely both planets had oceans and continents, which is just a fun fact for you. Venus went through its hellish landscape changes, which is what we see today with it being the hottest planet in the solar system. Mars, however, had different
different issues. As its magnetosphere degraded and ultimately failed, the atmosphere would be stripped away by solar winds, leading to the barren planet that we see today. This is why actually now it's so difficult to establish a colony on Mars, as we have yet to do so anyways, because we still don't fully understand how to keep out ionizing radiation from the sun. And just as a fun fact, Venus also does not have a magnetosphere. Interesting, is it not? Regardless, when Mars was habitable, it would appear as though humans either evolved there or were more technologically advanced back in history. I would have to say it's the former over the latter, and here's why. If we evolved on this timeline on Earth and were technologically far enough along, we would have retained that tech unless there was some cataclysmic event. The Earth-based humans would have just shut the ark, sealing the creatures on Mars rather than allowing them to ransack Earth, and our portals would have just continued to run the same as in other areas. However, based on the fossil record on Mars, it would appear that humans stem there first. The reason is because when the Ark was created, it's assumed the planet had been ransacked by monsters accidentally created by the 24th chromosome injection. Those who were just superhuman were supposedly good, and then they kept their humanity, but they were driven off the planet by the monsters they created. It was sort of a drop everything and run scenario. And this is why the Ark was forgotten through successive generations as technology would have to be built back up to pre-chromosome introduction levels. Basically, when they got to Earth, it was back to, you know, sticks and rocks, baby. With humans stranded on Earth, this would now become the new assumed home for humanity, and through time, the Ark would fade away into obscurity. It would also seem during this time that unless the 24th chromosome was administered implicitly, then it too would fade away from the human genome. Sounds strange, doesn't it? Well, actually, it's not so strange. So let's head on over into the gene and why it may not have been passed down to successive generations. The biggest thing between, say, your body and your child's body is simply how a cell divides. There are two forms of division, mitosis and meiosis. The whole point of mitosis is to replace the cells within your body. This constant replacement of cells ensures that you can heal from damage, fight off diseases in most cases, react to your environment properly, and just in general thrive as a person. The division of a cell is designed to copy the DNA which is already contained within the nucleus, then send that new DNA to the daughter cell and boom, you have two cells that are perfectly functional and pretty much identical. Now, the issue with mitosis is it's not perfect. Mutations happen all the time. DNA gets chopped off or is incorrectly coded. Thymine dimers disrupt the whole process. The issue is quite prevalent and we call this aging. In fact, just as a fun thought experiment, what is immortality? Immortality is really a sense of not meeting your end via aging and it's something as simple as correcting the damage to your body. Invulnerability means that nothing can hurt you. If you could take a template of you at birth, which stem cells actually might be a good candidate for, you could program them in using CRISPR and then use that genetic template of when you were young and your cells work properly. So in theory, you could use that, apply that to older cells, fix the genetic damage, and that would make you immortal. Pretty strange, but a nice thought experiment for future scientists to conduct. Now the issue with mitosis is this damage continues to mount over time. This builds up in those cells, like making a copy of a damaged copy. Eventually you get to the point when you have a non-viable cell. When this happens, you go into multi-organ failure when enough of them do this, and then it's lights out. It is hypothesized that a cell can reproduce about 60 times before becoming completely unviable. This is known as the Hayflick limit. You and I are very susceptible to this with our 23 pairs of chromosomes. Now the other form of cellular division is known as meiosis. This process of meiosis takes place within the sex cells of humans. Here, genetically different cells can be produced at random, but usually still would produce viable young after fertilization. Daughter cells produced during meiosis are genetically different from one another, and this is important. This ensures that the same plague that might wipe out your parents might not wipe you out, or some ailment that might run in your family might be completely muted during the genetic exchange. Then, with the introduction of new genetic material to work with from a partner, you get things like you know, almost an entirely different organism. Well, it's still human, but it's still also related to parents and siblings. The thing about meiosis, however, is you get haploid cells, which is just 23 chromosomes, so 23 pairs of chromosomes are 46 chromosomes, you know, math. But you get 23 chromosomes rather than diploid cells that have 46 chromosomes. Diploid is the product of mitosis, meaning that all the DNA is there that it needs. Meiosis would produce the haploid cells, which contain half the DNA that is combined with a partner to create a diploid cell, which then produces something like you. With the introduction of the 24th chromosome, this clearly changes the game a little bit. Now, something to understand about mitosis is it copies whatever is there. The introduction of the 24th chromosome would absolutely be copied over in this process of cellular division. So whoever receives it would have it for life. We will discuss the benefits of it here in a moment on a cellular level, but the sex cells are different. With the 24th chromosome introduced into the body, the body would only take half that information. When it does, it would in turn likely mute most, if not all, the benefits of having such information in the genes. So what's passed along to the child isn't the 24th chromosome, but likely just sort of like a patch in of information 
information that was either damaged and could not be read or didn't have any impact on the body. Or it's totally possible it was literally designed not to affect sex cells at all so that it wouldn't even be copied in the first place. Ultimately, this would lead to adults who fled Mars with the 24th chromosome and then their subsequent children or us having these standard 23 pairs of chromosomes that are native to our species. It was basically bred out through natural functions and this may have actually been the original intention of the designers, a self-limiting genetic augmentation that should it go awry, the children would survive while the problem was worked out. And it would appear for a time that everything must have been fine with the 24th chromosome introduction. But this was not to last because these safeguards do appear to have stayed in place allowing for the survival of our species, but there's probably a reason we're not living on Mars anymore. So what does the 24th chromosome actually do? Well, it would appear to me based on what Samantha says that this likely codes for proteins that are bioengineered. We have proteins within our bodies currently coded for by things like our DNA. And what they do is they proofread DNA, assist with mitosis, and help us build new cells. We refer to these almost pre-proteins as amino acids. These can be conglomerated together to create a chain, and this will become a full-fledged protein that we know and love. From here, they can bend, fit into one another, and build structures that we need. The 24th chromosome in mind would probably be an amino acid chain that would then work with our naturally occurring protein structures to increase their natural capacities, all while negating issues. So where does the first place start? Well, clearly, if you want to build build a good house, you start with a foundation, right? So the first thing it would need to kind of mess with is your DNA and keeping it in check. The 24th chromosome likely affected the DNA first and conserved it, as well as fixing mutations in the coding itself. This would be imperative later on for things like mitosis. Naturally occurring DNA polymerase within the body is what proofreads our coding. When it comes across an anomaly or break, it quickly works to fix it by installing the correct opposite sequence or point. However, should two points across from one another change at random, or an entire segment be lost, DNA polymerase is limited in its ability to correct these problems, and usually this will result in a mutation being accepted or completely break it, leading to the end of the cell. The thing that you have to hope for is that this random mutation doesn't break somewhere important or happen somewhere important, and this is kind of what induces cancer. The 24th chromosome may serve as a sort of template as well as a bioengineered super polymerase that could go through and correct all the coding. This is supported by the lack of cancer which arises from genetic mutations, seeing as the polymerase fixes these mutations, cancer is a non-issue. Viruses were also rendered obsolete when they try to hijack a cell, the 24th chromosome stops the cell from reading and implementing what the virus wants because it goes through, reads the coding, and then cuts out that section of DNA because it's not supposed to be there. Diseases were all but eradicated because of the fixing of the genetic coding, which I personally believe is what we're going to figure out because we are overdue for a medical revolution here pretty soon. Like, we're supposed to be right on the cusp and I believe CRISPR is it. Another area downstream of the DNA DNA is fixing the physical damage to the meat suit, because let's face it, even though our bodies are pretty good at the ability to heal itself, it's nowhere near perfect. As we age, this ability to heal gets worse, and eventually, you sort of just start living with injuries. As the cell undergoes mitosis, what we have talked about earlier, genetic damage builds up, and this can lead to slower mitosis and less effective cells as well. So healing capacity just goes straight out the window. The 24th chromosome, having taken care of the genetic anomalies that crop up during mitosis, now also influences the mitotic pathways within the body. When you are, say, injured. A signal goes out to the surrounding cells of the injury to begin dividing to heal the wound. Now depending on the severity, this can go from a couple days to a couple weeks to years even, but with the extra chromosome though, we know in the body there are pathways of activation for mitosis. Likely, when receiving a signal to begin reproduction of cells at an increased rate, the genes are quickly copied by the super polymerase at a capacity well beyond ours, allowing to heal incredibly fast. Now this would produce heat based on how bad the wound is, which even though humans were superhuman with enough damage, they could still be ended. That's why even those with the 24th chromosome were forced to flee as they could still meet their end, likely if they took enough damage to their bodies. However, for smaller wounds like the one on Reaper, the body would compensate for this heat increase to a degree with little detriment to itself. Then once the activation signal was shut off, the body is healed, so too does the mitosis switch off and return to normal. Another thing to note about the 24th chromosome is that it also appears to drastically increase the strength for anyone who is exposed to it, whether they are good or evil, but also also increases the intellect of those deemed good while somewhat degrading those deemed evil, which is really just suggesting more of a mental issue later. But we will get to those soon when we discuss the differences and why those arose. The strength of those with the 24th chromosome would, in my mind, for those who are evil, mean that they have more muscle capacity doubled as we see that they get bigger the longer they are infected. They also exhibit growth structurally concerning the skeleton, which means likely the whole body is growing. To those deemed good, likely this strength increase is not as great, but still quite present. Stronger than a 
regular human, this may be because the barriers of the mind were being removed on muscle strength. So we have in us all the ability to be much stronger than we think we are. But to protect us from damage, our brains limit what we can do. If we went 100% all the time, in fact, we don't even go, I believe it's down to like 40%, you could train and get up to 60% of your actual strength, but you'll never approach 100%. But if we went 100% all the time, we would be constantly injured and our bodies would degrade. However, with the introduction of increased healing capacity, there is no detriment apart from resources being used more heavily within the body. This barrier may be intentionally broken by the chromosome addition, intentionally breaking those in place barriers. Originally, the chromosome creation was intended to do this to make people stronger and unlock their human potential. However, the unforeseen consequences of producing monsters meant that they were stronger as well. So strength appears to have been a natural byproduct of the chromosome. The intelligence may just quite literally be forcing a quicker way for neurons to communicate. So uh, the thinking is, well, why don't we just have bigger brains? Wouldn't we be smarter? Well, the problem is with the human brain right now, where do we go from here? The thinking, like I said, is adding gray matter would make us more intelligent, but this actually isn't right because it would slow down our brains. For instance, Neanderthal had a larger brain than modern man. They were by no means stupid, but they weren't assumed to be much more capable than Homo sapiens. So one way we may be able to become smarter in a sense is quicker connections within the brain. This may allow us to access different ideas previously assumed not to happen simply because of connections in place. In fact, there's an entire world out there about the neurological capacity and how to speed it up. I'd highly look into it. It's pretty interesting. But what I can assume is that the myelin sheath of the neuron cell body may possess some sort of chemical that makes it even faster than the already 100 meters per second a nerve impulse can travel, which now makes the person smarter by association and may make them appear to operate at an increased capacity concerning time dilations when dealing with monsters. For those that are deemed evil, however, neural degradation is quite present. They are not stupid, though. They will still exhibit a lot of the same tendencies that they had in their original life, such as when Goat knew he was turning and still signed the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before taking himself out, or when the Hell Knight brandishes a literal chainsaw. This would indicate that the brain is still working in some capacity to allow them to remain functional and planning like their original human form. However, now they will become much more animalistic as time goes on. This indicates it's much more like an infection. The 24th chromosome slowly builds up in your body and converts your cells, or at least your genetic coding, and based upon the naturally occurring neurological chemistry and functions, you either turn into a superhuman or a complete monster. The reason I believe it to be an infection is we see you are either injected by a syringe intentionally, like Reaper was, and it takes a couple minutes for it to affect you, you get bit in the neck by a monster like Goat was, which turned him, or the blood gets onto your skin, slowly infecting you like how Sarge was infected by the monkey blood dripping from the ceiling. Speaking of monkey blood, let's discuss for a moment why the coagulation within the blood is happening. After testing the blood and seeing what type it was, it was determined that the blood was not human at all. Well, likely every single cell in the body was being changed, so I see a few possibilities. Seeing as blood is pretty versatile and meant to float around, the introduction of the chromosome to good candidates, the blood stays in its typical form, but in the presence of bad candidates, the blood is damaged and continues to divide. It instead becomes misshapen as well and then coagulates together as protein runs rampant and they're formed incorrectly. We actually see this presentation literally all over their body with the skin cells beginning to deform. So the second option that I see is the blood is perfectly fine but the body is changing in such a drastic way that heat is building up and is causing portions of the blood to become destroyed. When this happened, it coagulates like it normally would but doesn't end up causing heart attacks since the healing ability of these monsters would bypass the damage of blocked cells. As the damage continues, however, this would likely result in even more damage to the body via coagulation. Now, given those two choices, I would have to say it's more than likely the first one versus the second one, but it could also still be a combination of both. So I brought up Mars being habitable at the beginning because I believe this played a role in why all of a sudden these issues started to arise. Should humanity have originally evolved on Mars while it was habitable, we may have been able to draw a parallel between the planet itself and the changes in the genetic coding causing these monsters to form. So the question is, are there really good or bad people leading to these issues? Personally, I don't believe so. First, I don't believe that the 10% of the human genome codes for a soul because if we do have souls, those are likely energy rather than some physical thing coded for in our cells. I know, we are getting really new wave with that statement, but uh, it just is what it is. What I do believe though, is the injection of the 24th chromosome actually appears to still be influenced by the DNA of the person as much as it influences the DNA of the person. So let me postulate this. When the 24th chromosome was introduced into the population, the planet had a magnetosphere and everything was good. Likely there were some issues with those who already had problems within their genetic coding, but these were not known until it was too late. Almost sort of like how in I Am Legend they were trying to cure cancer, everything
everything was going good. They released it to the population, and then after it mixed within the population, it disastrously affected certain individuals. So when Mars's magnetosphere started failing, this let in ionizing radiation. This in turn would go on to damage the DNA of a person and may have overwhelmed the bioengineered proteins of the designers of the 24th chromosome. In turn, it changed what the chromosome was doing and caused them to devolve into monsters. We can actually sort of see evidence of this. Supposedly, it's taking some who are good and some who are bad and changing them. Samantha mentions how those infected were choosing some over others based on their brain chemistry. But I believe it to be a combination of both the mind and the DNA. Inside a human, there is a certain string of genes that can code for something known as psychopathy. These are believed to be damages to the genes themselves because in the nature versus nurture debate, it's held that this is purely nature that causes psychopaths. I believe that if someone has these genes in them, it either isn't fully expressed or they have similar genes not in these areas that can cause a person to be sought after. And I would say, look no further than who is currently on Mars. One of the traits of psychopathy is characterized by a lack of anxiety in a lot of situations that likely calls for maybe a little bit of anxiety. Here we have soldiers of varying levels of expression possible, with Portman being the worst. You have doctors who separate from their families for 10 years with very little done to come back it seems, like Samantha. They are on another planet and really don't seem that worried or bothered. And judging by Dr. Carmack literally shutting the door on a woman, I know he was scared but he didn't really care. The fact is, this may not be completely psychopathic, but it does seem like some of the traits that kind of fall in line with that are definitely seen in some of the doctors. This would also explain why almost every scientist and soldier is turned on Mars despite it supposedly coming down to just good or evil. Their tendencies and potential mental degradation lead them to another planet and to an infection that fed upon what they were. Another option is to possibly co-opt the genetic damage done by ionizing radiation. Surely the society of superhumans didn't extinguish itself overnight based on what they have built, but it could also be possible that it was a slow and insidious burn. Over time, those with genetic damage would turn into monsters and regardless of what their brains were like previously, this led to a degradation while others chose to escape. This may also explain why the scientists and staff on Mars were being turned at alarming rates as their own genes had been damaged by the radiation, meaning that their exposure to the 24th chromosome would turn them into monsters. So Reaper didn't turn despite being a soldier and it's clear that, you know, things weighed heavily on him from the beginning. Take Duke for instance and he didn't want to go through nano walls because he was kind of scared of it, which suggests that he had anxiety over it. The kid disobeyed a direct order and ended up paying for it, but he was also scared to go through the Ark. The Destroyer, well, I don't know, man, he got he got tracked down, so he might have had some psychopathic tendencies. Sarge was absolutely a psycho, and Portman was the biggest psycho out of everybody. But getting back to Sarge, possibly what made him so successful was being a warrior. And being a warrior is something you need the inability to feel. We know that a lot of Vikings actually apparently were psychopaths, and that trait was seen as desirable to their women back in the day. So ultimately, here's what I believe is happening. It doesn't boil down to good or bad, but to your genetics. If you have coding for psychopathy, either majorly or minorly, this can cause you to become a monster when exposed to the 24th chromosome, as it seems to have a tendency to amplify what's already there. If you lack this set of gene issues, then your body's natural abilities are enhanced and you become superhuman. However, damage to certain portions of your genes may render you a monster later, which may be what happened to the Mars society as their magnetosphere failed and then let in more and more radiation. 